George Trakis is an environmental sculptor widely acclaimed for projects around the world, and Western is home to one of his works. His installations are unique. They emphasize the natural resources of the local area, he recycles local materials, incorporating them into the finished piece, and he always strives to maintain a strong sense of community where he builds his amazing works of art. Some people think, you know, <clears throat> often I've built things in certain situations like this, and people say, when are you going to put the art on it? Because <laughs> of these platforms and everything else. And that happens a lot, both in a humorous way. Everyone knows I'm an artist and doing it, but some people joke around and they ask me about that. So the work pretty much is not necessarily contrary, but shows another kind of perspective on uh, contemporary art, not uh, for people to look at and focus on the work itself as a shape or whatever, uh, but actually as a tool to look at their own environment. This was a very special situation when I came here and that Western allowed me to work with this extraordinary space, with this view, uh, to be part of this collection. Uh, it was a real adventure for me in the early part of my career. So it was, uh, you know, it's one of those early works where I was given carte blanche to work with a huge space. It wasn't a huge budget, but I knew I could handle it. The deck is basically a deck for students to come out of the music building, sit and enjoy the view. I mean, that's the base common denominator of the work. However, details in the work relative to music, um, when I conceived of it and when I started building it, uh, the music had an influence on me. Um, the decks, as you can see, are very much like a keyboard. And there are four of them, so that there's a kind of treble clef and a bass clef. Yeah. The work allows the spectator to have an experience that's unusual relative to decks and walkways. And uh, it asks them to, the, the mind of the spectator says, do you think I can take this step across that gap? And uh, the body says, no problem. And people feel like gathering here. And the dialogue that happens here at the same time, the view that they can look at, gets them away from the mundane, from the daily stuff. And uh, that to me, in a sense, is what the function of art. People go to museums to look at new stuff, uh, to look at invention and, and, uh, and colors and uh, figures, be them nude or whatever. This is how this functions. It's instead of standing in front of it or walking around it, you actually get on it and uh, feel your body on it. Uh, there are issues of security, balance. It, it kind of respects the intelligence of the viewer and that there are no railings in the front here. When you sit there coming up the walkway, there are no railings that set down at the base. So it kind of says, this is not a normal walkway here. This is not a normal deck. It's not just a, a bench you know, on a concrete footing. And so it kind of sensitizes and, and, uh, and puts the viewer kind of in touch with themselves and the materials of the work that they're on and the environment. And it's that kind of binary thing back and forth. So it, it very much is a kind of choreographic experience where the work kind of asks you uh, to be careful, but also have a little bit of an adventure. There's a lot of thinking that goes into my creation when I'm doing it that may not necessarily be understood or even felt when it's there, literally. That's what I love doing, you know. Access to inaccessible areas. So it really becomes an adventure, you know. People said, well, I've known that space for all my life and never been there. Now I can go there. You know, the main impulse is to take full advantage of a space that I can acquire uh, get permission to build on, and do something for its local population. Not for the art world, not for the critics in Seattle or in some big city. I really work for the community where I'm building. But no, I can't, you know, there's no, an artist doesn't retire who's healthy and wants to keep doing stuff. So, yeah, I'll be, keep doing it, they keep saying, I'll be playing in the end of the, you know, the edge of the coffin right by the time I go. I have to tell you before I tell you the official biography, you know, I have trouble when I travel packing my toothbrush. 
George packed his trowels and his brushes and was over at Baby Station this morning, cleaning places out, underneath looking, digging, scratching, making sure it was all okay. And, and they found out later that it was all okay. But George was born in Quebec, Canada, and has lived in New York City since 1963. Uh, he is best known for his permanent public artworks located in six countries and, and in many temporary site-specific installations. He came here in 1987 as part of, how many were there, you four of you? Three of us. Three of us were building kind of, kind of site-specific installations at Western. Um, his work has been exhibited by major art museums, including San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art, the Seattle Art Museum, the Whitney Museum, the Walker Center in Minneapolis and Minneapolis and Documenta 6 and 8 in Germany. And his work is also included in permanent collections of the Louisiana Museum of Denmark, the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, and among his many awards, George received the American Academy of Arts and Letters Merit Medal for Sculpture in 1996, the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and the Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. Very well traveled, speaks French because he was born in Quebec and works in France fluently in French. Um, I met him because the, uh, the track, is, if you've been at the Bayview Station, um, was getting very slippery and the little metal plate coming up and down the hill was getting to be a little bit dangerous and, and certain people in the university were worried about safety, of which I can share their concern. And so a number of us met last spring and kind of looked at it and talked about it and thought about what we were going to do and kind of like, how do we do this? And, and, I, and May, and you, May 24th, you told me, I got on the phone. June 24th, yes. I called George. And I introduced myself, and he goes, oh, so good to hear from you. Can I come out? And I said, yes, you can come out. And so then half four got here, and half four called him out. And so here we are. Uh, and I got to say, um, a, more, a more pleasant visit for a day so far, I couldn't imagine. So welcome. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be back in Billingham, and to especially be invited by the university to come back to discuss restoring Bayview Station, which I've heard is well used by students. Uh, the uh, Path of Desire, the lifeline that Dean Spitzer just mentioned, uh, definitely needs work. And I've been working with Hapthor, the new director of the Western Collection uh, of Sculpture. Uh, and we're really coming to resolution on it. And uh, it's, it'll be restored hopefully uh, next March or sooner. Uh, so that uh, people will be able to start walking it next spring again. Um, I have some kind of unique slides um, that Deirdre Phillips, who is in the audience with her husband Christopher, who have become dear friends. Uh, their daughter lives in New York and uh, we stay in touch. Deirdre was working for the symposium back in 87 and took a lot of slides. So many of her slides are part of this situation. and. Uh, it really is extraordinary to have been given a site or to select a site. I think I'll start with the slides. So here on the left is the original site uh, with my bag there on the bench. <laughs> and uh, everyone was completely positive about me using this rather large space. That was, uh, and uh, th th this is the work done in 1987. Um, it really is to me, uh, when I was looking at the site, in August, it was actually early August of 87, some of the windows were open on the practice rooms. And so there was piano music coming out and French horns and violins. And uh, you know, with your back to the music building, looking out on Billingham Bay, uh, I was very much influenced by that atmosphere of music. And uh, so in a sense, Bayview Station uh, being a, a kind of <clears throat> landing and a taking off point uh, a station is like where you go to get, you know, go to get someplace. Uh, but it's also the, the, the decks, particularly, are like a celebratory mass um, uh, of of the environment and especially the view. And uh, in surveying the site, they basically knew that I could do uh, four 20-foot lengths of steel. Steel comes in 20-foot lengths, and so in a sense, uh, uh, they're sort of like keyboards. It's kind of like uh, um, the treble clef and the, and the bass clef that, you, that kind of span the hill. And uh, the planking is almost like keys, piano keys. In the dark here, I'm going to try and move forward. Mm 
Um, there is a plan of the site, an architect's drawing, with the, uh, this long walkway that comes up from the street, from the bus stop, and from Bellingham. Um, here is that area of, that the landscape architects made, those benches, etc. Here is the PAC Center. And um, I noticed people coming up here. And the first morning <clears throat> I was looking at the site, a student nonchalantly just climbed over the, the railing here and just walked up the bank uh, <clears throat> to this point here. And it was just like a path of desire. I immediately realized that student probably does that every day. And uh, so that was really a strong force that I saw, a kind of uh, uh, a solution. And so <clears throat> from this point here down to the landing there, I started building um, the walkway. The other thing I discovered is that I went up under the PAC Center to see where that student went. And there's a little parking area here. Here's, again, here's the site that I'm working on. But that path is a straight line. And there's this whole bald spot here of where people use the walkway to come up and go under the PAC Center to go up to Canada House and other buildings. It's a real shortcut uh, relative to having to go all the way up the staircase and in front of PAC Center over on the road there. So to me, it was a, just a given lifeline uh, that would really animate the site and that the students would immediately start losing. And that's what happened. There you can see the beginning of the first piece of angle iron, just finding that axis. And then later on, uh, uh, putting, the, putting the framework together. And you can see we're just starting to do the decking up there. But to me, the important thing was to get that walkway built and finished, obviously. Uh, and it was built and finished. Here's again, just working on the decks. There you can see the framework. Of the, of the walkway. Uh, here it is, again, sloping down there. Again, we haven't even started over here. Uh, that's an earlier slide. There it is on the right in, in more completion. It actually slopes right down to that landing there. And uh, People started understanding what was going on with that walkway. Again, we're, now you can see the decking and the, and the, uh, the columns. Uh, the columns very much relate to also the columns under the pack center. Uh, each column is very different. Some of them are wood. There's different diameters. There are different types of wood from different sources in Bellingham that relate to the industrial history of Bellingham. Some of them are from Mount Baker plywood. Some of them are from the Osier Cedar Mill and others are from Georgia Pacific that no longer exists, but we actually acquired logs from Georgia Pacific. So you're on decks that are being held up by local material and the view is actually at those sources. There's the walkway, you can hardly see me down there, but uh, <clears throat> actually I, I think this slide, maybe go to this slide here. Yes, there I am early one morning Without asking permission, I actually rented a, a jackhammer from hardware sales here. And uh, very early in the morning, starting about 7.30, by 10.30, I had broken through the little parapet down there, the thing that blocked students, took the railing out. And uh, around noon, uh, somebody from the university came down and said, um, I would have appreciated if you'd called me or let me know that you were going to do this. And I told them, really, if I asked for permission, it probably would have taken three months to get permission to do it. And I'm not here this long, I have to get this piece done. And uh, he said, you're right. <laughs> so there was no conflict. Um, here we are still working on the decks. Uh, the walkway is done. And in this slide, you can see people immediately starting to use the walkway. So it was just great to be working on the, on the decks and everything. It made, um, there was a huge release, a kind of relief with the walkway open down at the other end. And because uh, you could see students were completely drawn to that walkway to come up. It's finally, their paths of desire were being respected and uh, by, a, by an artist uh, who they thought was really just a construction worker on the site. Uh, there's the breakthrough there down at the, uh, 
down at the base at the landing. Um, the other tremendous coincidence was to have a light here. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I'd asked to put a, if in a, if I'd asked to put a light in, it would have been prohibitively expensive to do that. But the fact that there was a light right there at that break in the uh, in the uh, parapet uh, was just ideal, and it's still there. And uh, you know, I think it's a very important important factor in that transition when you come up from the street. There's a light. There's this walkway, and then either students go up to the Viking Union uh, or come up the ramp. This stone is also a coincidence. If the stone had been here, it kind of would have been difficult to make a path, a straight line of desire up that rampway. But that stone is just has tremendous kind of weight and power, and it's a piece of native geology uh, in contrast to all those columns under the pack center. Another element is the pack center uh, here slopes it's actually the seating of the, the of the stage was in the opposite uh, view, for, and it's, of course it's in a dark room. Bayview Station is a kind of the, the stage for Bayview Station is Billingham Bay. Some of the things that happen, uh, you know, I'm working on a lot of sites all over the world. Is I get to meet local people, and and here you see Daisy and Camelia, the daughters of uh, Deidre Phillips and Christopher Phillips. Uh, Deidre was working for the symposium and brought her daughters to see me working and told them, this is a sculptor, this is a real sculptor working. And uh, they actually helped me uh, when I came back in 95, put this alger stone uh, as a kind of passage down between the decks. Two other people that were part of the work crew were Alan Hees, a fantastic welder who was actually a student in medieval art history at the university, and John Ford, an Australian, um, who uh, you can see here is actually debarking the original railing. And they became, you know, working friends uh, during the process. And here we have the finished work with students on it. Uh, a couple here looking out on Billingham Bay uh, with all the various elements relating to organ pipes uh, and the aspect of being in front of the music building or behind the music building. Uh, in those days, we planted birch trees that have been recently taken out, and they're now burgundy cherries. New burgundy cherries have been planted. But the experience of coming here and uh, starting this piece immediately as, after I got here, getting permission to work on this site without having to go for permits. There are no drawings. There were no drawings submitted. We just bought steel from Morris that was delivered. Some of the materials were purchase ordered through physical plan or the department were delivered to the site up here. We dragged them down and just built the work in four weeks uh, before students came back in September. And, uh, it was a lot of sweat, a lot of toil. We had a wonderful time together. Actually, was this originally intended to be a permanent piece? No, it was not. It was, it was um, the symposium was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts with the original uh, or the first uh, director of the Western Collection, Lawrence Hansen, uh, had applied for a couple of years ahead of time. Um, he selected three artists, uh, Alice Aycock, uh, Michael McRafferty from Seattle, and myself. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Alice said she didn't want to build anything unless it was permanent. Um, I, did, I was working in Berlin, and I flew in from Berlin to work. I had you know, no connection with anybody except that I had to be there to build something in August. And uh, it ended up that Alice was given you know, funding for you know, 35000 for permanent work. I had a $15,000 budget. Good question, because this work was built for 15,000 total. Materials cost 5,000, a little under 5,000, and uh, the fee was for 10, from which I paid Alan and, and John, uh, you know, a nominal fee, an hourly rate, and, uh, um, and then we all left in September. Michael went back to Seattle, Alice back to New York, and I back to Berlin. Um, so it was a symposium, 
there were there was I believe a panel discussion um, in one of the, the I don't think it was in this building I don't think this building was built then um, and that's that that was the context of my presence here was a, 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 a sculpture symposium uh, but most of the time we spent on site working Alice brought assistance from New York uh, she had a lot of assistance here from local people I was fortunately given uh, John Ford and Alan Hees uh, and um, two other ladies Nancy uh, but John and, and Alan were really especially John he did a lot of the post holes to put in the footings the concrete footings for the posts and the steel I also did a lot of post hole digging for all the footings for the ramp uh, so it was a definitely a working a working man symposium for all of us. Yes. Originally, Larry brought me to a site on the other side of the Viking Union that I looked at. I said, "This is, this is nothing to do here." I mean, <laughs> and says, "Well, I have another one." So, uh, and I'd seen I'd seen this site. And uh, so we went here, I said, this is it, you know, I said, so it was, it was kind of a, a brief collaboration, but it was in the morning of August, on the morning of the August 10th. And as soon as I, as soon as this site was okay, I couldn't believe it, uh, because between the Viking Union and, and, the, and the pack, and to have that view, it was just like total ecstasy for me to begin thinking of building something there. So I immediately started thinking of the budget, uh, calling around to find out prices of steel and, and lumber for some reason that summer angles were like 15 cents a pound beams were like 23 cents a pound lumber was like way down in terms of board footage and I knew I could get this thing built uh, for under under five I mean in terms of materials Con there was incidental stuff like concrete uh, you know lag bolts uh, um, carriage bolts etc but not that much it was mostly welding equipment well I rented a truck from budget and uh, rented welding equipment from uh, Central Welding here in Billingham. All the companies that still exist were incredibly cooperative. Hardware sales uh, were, was a major source of materials, um, incidental hardware connectors, mechanical connectors, etc. cetera. Um, um, so that, I hope I answered the question. I mean, it was, it was, it was something that was uh, even as temp even as knowing it, see, I didn't really. When I build things, I build things permanently. Uh, the one is the one element that that perhaps I, I should have beefed up was the floor plate for the walkway. Um, I'd never heard of floor plate being eighth inch thick, but Morris Steel had it, so I went with it, and I liked it because it was flexible. There was a kind of because it was thin. When you walked on it, it kind of sounded. And I built a work in Germany uh, 10 years earlier that I'll show here briefly uh, that did have a sounding element that manifests your presence in the landscape by each footstep has a sound. And I like that element of kind of being able to focus the power of an individual to have imp acoustical impact on the environment by sound. Yes. And, uh, and the view over, over the bay. Yes. I, I saw somewhere that uh, you were thinking about the connection to the town. Yes. City. Yes. Could you say something about that? Um, <clears throat> Hathor's asked me that <clears throat> the, the connection, the material connections, or the choice of materials in the piece uh, relative to local industry or, or, or the town of Billingham. And I, I'd earlier mentioned. Um, Osier Cedar is a cedar mill um, in view of the piece, as well as Mount Baker plywood, as well as Georgia Pacific in those days. And um, the, <clears throat> Mount Baker plywood make plywood there, and what they use is huge logs. These two logs here that are bolted together, there are two of them, it's kind of figure eight or an infinity sign, um, relate to Ma Mount Baker plywood, but also as two things that are bolted together, they're to me like the double base, you know, and there are other pipes that are shorter like piccolos, others that are longer, uh, that are like uh, tubas or something. So there, there's a, there's a, a variety of, of shapes, especially the vertical shapes, that relate to tones and music. Um, I mean, again, this is my, 
conceptual, compositional license as an artist. I'm sure when people go there, um, you know, they don't see it as that. Most people probably say, this is a deck, that's a walkway. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, but, you know, the, uh, the art can also integrate details for, that for some people who are sensitive and look at it a certain way can see those varieties mean something. There are, square, there are square columns that hold things up that are short. There are round pipes that are taller with larger diameter. And so they all have a sense of character uh, relative to the piece, but also in connection to stuff that's going on behind you. At the same time, there are things in the piece that relate to things in the city, uh, in Bellingham. And as I mentioned earlier, the decks are not one big flat deck. They're also at multiple levels. You have to, the, the distance between the decks uh, here and here and here, the three kind of openings or passageways, you can actually step right over that gap. Um, and that's an important factor, that you can do a stag leap over it. Uh, the element of choreography, I've seen people you know, on the, on the piece then reclining, people drawing, <laughs> reclining, not nude, but in that sense being a place where you can actually take a pose uh, as opposed to you know, the benches here, which are very flat and, and kind of mundane. The other aspect of the work is I've always believed that art should transport people into another domain um, and, uh, and, and kind of create a, a sense of relief from the mundane. So that th that earlier mentioning of creating a celebratory mass to the view of Billingham and also just the existence of the town of Billingham relative to this piece in the sanctuary of the college especially between the Performing Arts Center and the Viking Union, is very intended. It was a site that, uh, that was, for me, magical. And you'll see with other sites that I've worked on, this is really a very special place. And for me to have built here and to be paid to do this was like just a luxury. <laughs> and it's a luxury to be back here uh, that the university is really still considers of value and, and that they really want to commit to uh, restoring it and, and working on it so it's more permanent. And it's pretty much why I'm here and it is great to be here and to be able to do that.